Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, good morning from my side. Um, as already stated, I will uh, give you some insight into stakeholders' perspectives on the ecosystem service concept. And um, we'll just give some background information, then um, my research questions that led to my uh, research. Um, sorry. <laughs> some, some, the methods that I used. Um, <laughs> an insight into the results, and then some conclusions and recommendations. Okay, some background. I won't give you any background into the ecosystem service concept, as we heard already uh, about it. But um, I want to state that this concept is regarded as an academic or scientific construct. So it's something that you find in scientific journals, at conferences. So we heard it several times in the course of this conference. Um, and in literature, it's already addressed as mainstream. However, um, in practice, it seems that it, uh, there is only a limited engagement to apply it. So when you talk with stakeholders in the practice, um, it's often questioned or they don't even know it. And uh, this was something that we experienced um, in the beginning of my research. And uh, this led to the questions. Um, whether different actors in river landscape management know the ecosystem service concept and whether they are aware of its possible applications. Um, we wanted to find out whether they apply this concept in the working environment, whether they see it as, see it as practicable and whether, whether and which concerns there are regarding this, the concept's implementation. And uh, for this reason, I selected uh, two case studies um, in the context of rural landscape management in Austria. Um, the first one was the River Enns, uh, in the steering part of the River Enns in Austria. Here are just two nice images uh, from a restored site and a part of the national park. Um, and the second site was the Drava River, uh, the Corinthian part of this river also two restored sites of this river. Um, and I used these cases um, for the selection of stakeholders. So I addressed stakeholders that were, had a personal or professional interest in these two river landscapes. Um, and I led, I conducted together with uh, colleagues, 110 qualitative interviews with stakeholders from different fields, which um, included water management, of course, but also nature protection, tourism, um, forestry, agriculture. And um, I wanted to determine their knowledge on the concept, um, the role of this uh, concept in practice, um, their awareness of the practical applications and how they perceive its practicability. And I analyzed these interviews then um, using a content analysis and um, just some aspects were also analyzed quantitatively. Yeah, and um, coming to the results. Um, first of all, uh, knowledge and awareness regarding the concept. So what you can see here is that the major majority of the stakeholders um, did we're not familiar with the concept. So it doesn't seem to be part of a general knowledge that people have. Um, they had not heard of the concept before. And um, when you divide this into different stakeholder groups, so these are the different stakeholder groups on the X axis. And um, you see here the extent to or the, the knowledge um, regarding the concept, whether they are aware or familiar with this concept or not. And what you can see here, is um, that people in planning, spatial planning or landscape planning, uh, more often indicated a famili familiarity and also people from nature protection were very aware of it. Um, however, people or stakeholders from agriculture and tourism, um, they indicated that they were not familiar with it. And um, yeah, we, we also found that in particular respondents with a very close relationship uh, to academia, um, regarded this concept as well-known and also stated that it was kind of a buzzword. Um, and others stated that they did not know the concept or had only heard uh, of it as a keyword key and also stated that it has not arrived in practice yet, according to their uh, feeling. 
Um, we also asked them whether they see the concept as relevant in their working environment. And um, it was also about a, by about half of the interviews, it was, uh, it was seen as a feasible approach. Um, it was mostly observed as being addressed already indirectly, for instance, in the frame of uh, environmental impact assessments or um, status assessments according to the Water Framework Directive. Um, and what we can see here is that there are also certain differences between the different stakeholder groups as before, but comparing the two um, figures, um, we found that not necessarily those people who, who stated that they knew the concept also regarded this as, as relevant. It was rather the other way around. So it needs to be discussed whether this has some kind of influence, whether people know the concept and regard it as relevant, and other people who know the concept say that it's not relevant. So this is kind of a contradiction somehow. Um, yeah, we also asked them how, which possible practical applications they would see. And um, they stated that it could be a support for planning and decision-making purposes due to its integrative character, um, due to its uh, possibility to breaking down complexity to tangible units, um, and to, to increase objectivity. And um, this was seen as useful for, for approaching politicians or people from economy, and also for raising acceptance in society. Um, and it was also seen as a useful communication and education tool. Um, it was seen as uh, fostering understanding for the connectedness of society with nature, which was something that you also showed before, and um, increasing societal interest for protecting nature. However, there were also certain concerns regarding the implementation of the concept. So um, people stated that they questioned the comprehensibility. They stated that it was too complex or that uh, it could pro probably wrongly interpret it. Also the objectivity, that is something that is um, often stated when, uh, when, it, when it's uh, discussed about the ecosystem service concept, that it is an objective approach, this was questioned. In particular, with regard to different assessment methods where a weighing process uh, is included. And so um, the, they stated that there could be an influence through political or financial interests. And also the term black box um, was stated, in particular with regard uh, to multi-criteria assessment methods. Yeah, this is linked to the assessment bias. Um, and this was in particular um, stated with regard to ideal values. So these cultural services that you mentioned as very important, they were seen as not being covered with the assessment methods that are available and that are used. And also the redundancy with other concepts was mentioned. As I stated before, people regarded this, regarded this concept as already included in uh, the Water Framework Directive or environmental impact assessment. So they stated that it was something, no, nothing new uh, they stated that it was something that it's already applied for 20 years, but just under another term. And in particular, in administration, people stated that they don't have time and not the resources to implement another, another concept. So they stated that they have already followed so many regulations, guidelines, assessment schemes that they do not want to have another one. Yeah, coming to the conclusion, uh, conclusions, um, this study aimed at identifying the practical relevance of the concept and revealed that it has not yet arrived in the working environment of the practice actors in Austrian river landscape management yet. And uh, that there was a limited awareness regarding the concept and uh, certain concept concerns with regard to practical apl application. And um, this led to some recommendations that we have for a further development of uh, the ecosystem service concept, um, which is to raise aver awareness among the relevant stakeholder groups. So the, we, we see there is a need to foster capacity building um, so that also the stakeholder groups that are, are now not aware of the concept have a better understanding of it. 
Um, also, the requirements of the actor should be taken into account when talking about it. And um, a better communication of this concept and what is behind the concept um, should also take place. Um, and we see the need for an, an expansion of inter and transdisciplinary approaches. So we see the need uh, for more interactive, <coughs> more integrative um, ways and um, try to um, include this in, this in this graph here. So we see the need um, to involve researchers from different fields, but also practice experts um, from different fields, NGOs, and also the people living in the areas that are affected when doing assessments. Um, yeah, and we also see the need for tailoring this concept also to specific uh, questions in practice. And this is just a possible integrative uh, approach for doing so. Um, yeah, we also see, um, we also would recommend to provide guidance for the practical application. So to provide clear steps that can be followed in integrating the concept, in particular with regard to um, implementing this in policies and decision-making processes. And um, we also recommend building on experiences that were already gained in the implementation of other concepts. So in particular in river landscape management, there have been already uh, many processes in the past uh, implementing other concepts and we should build on experiences that were gained there. And with regard to the evaluation methods, um, there, is, there seems to be a need to further develop these and also think of probably alternative uh, evaluation methods, in particular with regard to these cultural services that are always um, seeing as being uh, left out, um, that are also including non-monetary values. So a combination of quantitative and qualitative approaches could be a way. And um, an interview framed it like, an immaterial, immaterial argumentative approach to reach people's heart and a rational approach for the correct expertise-based valuation could be beneficial. And I think this is something that could be uh, bear in mind when, when further developing this concept. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Okay, so um, good morning on my behalf uh, to everybody as well. And uh, I'm telling you now um, a bit about our study um, called Valuing Brooks in an Urban Environment. And uh, it was pretty much about uh, uh, finding out residents' opinions about uh, brook restoration in Helsinki region. And, um, and uh, at the down there, you can see the uh, other people working with me in, in my uh, working group. So uh, here are shortly the contents, uh, what I'm going to tell you uh, today. So uh, first few words, why we have this interest in urban brooks. Uh, then I go to a study uh, shortly, what, where and when, what we did. Uh, then the results um, about the residents' opinions about urban brooks. And, and then I tell you about the willingness to pay uh, for the, um, what was the willingness to pay for the improved state of, of urban brooks. And then uh, I draw a few conclusions from that. So uh, I really don't think we need a question mark there at the first point, um, are brooks an underrated part of the urban environment? Um, I think they very much uh, still are. Um, usually we don't know that they are there, even that they are there, they might be like behind the bushes and fences and, and underground pipelines. And even if they exist, uh, it usually looks pretty much like this. So, uh, so they are huge hydrological and physical alter alterations, poor water quality problems with littering, and of course that uh, brings uh, lots of ha um, loss, uh, loss in habitats and, and also in landscape. Uh, however, uh, urban brooks are really valuable environments uh, wherever they exist, because uh, they are important parts of catchment areas. Uh, they provide lots of habitats and biodiversity, and, and when they are in, in good status, they could, uh, there's a great uh, potential of providing uh, various ecosystem services. And uh, that's why restoration of urban brooks has, has many benefits because um, it um, improves, uh, or through it, we can improve the water quality um, and flood protection, uh, improve biodiversity in urban areas, uh, improve recreational opportunities, aesthetic values, and, and also um, economic values, uh, which can um, 
show in in um, in increase in real estate prices or like improved fishery possibilities. So uh, instead of uh, thinking that um, thinking a, a sort of the traditional utilization of urban brooks and and thinking them as something we want to hide from from it, everybody. So, um, so I wonder, could the uh, future of our urban brooks be more like this, so that, um, that we could create something uh, nice out of them, something that could benefit the, uh, us and the society in, in many different ways? And um, this was pretty much the, um, the basis or background behind, behind our study, uh, where we wanted to find out uh, what are the residents of, of Helsinki, um, the capital of Finland, uh, feeling about um, the, um, their urban brooks and the brook restoration, and what would they be ready to pay for uh, improved ecosystem services and improved quality of, of the environment, uh, which would gain through uh, uh, brook restoration. And uh, here is our study area. So, um, so Helsinki is located in the most southern mo uh, southernmost part of, of Finland, and. Um, and in the sort of closer look map, you can see the brooks of our interest. Uh, there were 20 of them. And, uh, and as you can see from, um, from uh, the colors describe the water quality. So, um, so it's basically bad or poor in, in all of the brooks. And, and also the ecological state is, is pretty bad uh, as it is nowadays. So uh, this study uh, was carried out in, uh, in cooperation with SUKE, uh, Finnish Environment Institute, so my institute, and uh, Public Works Department of, of the city of Helsinki. And it actually started because of their need to, um, to find out what uh, people feel and know about uh, the urban brooks in Helsinki. And uh, we based this study on, um, on a paper called uh, Small Water Action Plan uh, that had been made uh, by city of Helsinki a few years earlier. And, um, and it was kind of um, a paper that, um, that guidelined uh, the management and, um, or the, the management of Helsinki Brooks in the future. So, um, so they had been figuring out all the restoration measures uh, and also estimated the costs of, of restoring the Brooks. And um, so we did um, a continent, value, uh, continent valuation survey questionnaire uh, that we sent to uh, 700 randomly chosen Helsinki residents uh, in, in October um, 2010. So this did uh, quite a few years ago, this study. And, um, and uh, the questionnaire uh, presented general questions about respondents' opinions and preferences to vo towards urban brooks and their restoration. And what we wanted uh, to uh, describe very carefully uh, where the objectives and benefits of brook restoration uh, in order uh, the people to understand what difference the restoration can make in, in uh, their everyday lives and how they can benefit that and from that and how the society can, can benefit from brook restoration. And after that, uh, we presented them, uh, them a scenario that uh, we asked them to, um, to imagine kind of a hy hypothetic uh, small water fund that could be established to improve the condition of brooks and, and other small water courses. And uh, that would be like funding the restoration uh, projects. And, and we tried to describe uh, true examples and true pictures that what would be that welfare change in, um, in the restoration, uh, during that restoration project. And after that, we were asking that, uh, that uh, would they be uh, willing to contribute to that? And if so what would be that exact sum they would like to pay from that welfare change? And, um, and then about the results. Um, so we started in a situation we really didn't even know if the Helsinki people knew anything about their small waters, if they even know that they existed. And, uh, and surprisingly, uh, the opinions towards Brooks were highly positive. Actually, people knew very much about them. They were um, sort of... Um, watching the brooks a lot. Um, it, um, sorry, I lost the words. Uh, they were like um, interested about the wildlife um, in there and, and, and they were pretty well aware that they existed and, and, and what well, they liked them. And as you can see, this is uh, this answers from one of, our, uh, one of our questions. So it shows a very positive trend uh, towards brooks and their restoration, which was of course fantastic. And, and also, it wasn't just about the use of brooks, 
but also they were seen as a part of the urban nature that should be preserved for future generations. And um, our response rate uh, was uh, uh, 38, which we were pretty pleased uh, for. And, uh, and about the answers, 71% uh, were either willing or possibly willing to pay for brook restorations. So, um, so from those sums they'd given to us, we uh, calculated the total economic value for the better brook quality in Helsinki and estimated that it would be at, at least uh, 7.8 million uh, euros per year. Compared to this, to the costs uh, uh, presented in the small water action plan, what would be the cost of, of uh, restoring Helsinki brooks? Um, the sum was uh, 500,000 euros divided to five different years. So, um, so you can really see that there is a very high benefit cost ratio, which would suggest then high returns on, on brook restoration investments. And a uh, few words about the main motives uh, behind the positive uh, willingness to pay. Here again, uh, this uh, um, value of existence uh, uh, scores very high. Uh, so that people, uh, I think it really shows that people uh, think the brooks are important as they are. And, uh, and they think that they really should be taken care of even to the future, future generations. So, then conclusions about our study. Um, according to our results, it seems very obvious that the Helsinki Small Water Action Plan is socially desirable and a good investment. And which was great that, uh, that the non-use values were, uh, only, uh, were also highly appreciated. So the biodiversity, landscape, value, ex value of existence. And which was very important in here. And, and we have to, um, have to uh, do like further studies um, uh, with that matter uh, was that uh, it seemed uh, that residents familiar with brook restoration projects uh, might be more willing to pay than than the um, people uh, not knowing anything about um, anything about them. We have this brook called Longinoya in Helsinki, which um, has we've been done there uh, many restoration projects. It has gained uh, very nice publicity in in the local media. Uh, we've arranged workshops where uh, people have been able to, uh, to participate to river restoration and do things with their own hands. And in Longinoya area, um, the willingness to pay was, was slightly bigger than, than somewhere else. So it was pretty encouraging that. And also pressures the importance of, of communication and education, what has been pressured here in, in almost every, every pres presentation, that, that's really when you make people aware of these things so they become more more interested and, and more willing also to participate. And uh, for the city of Helsinki and, and the policymakers in Finland, it's, uh, it's a really clear message. Uh, local populations have a great interest in, in restoring their neighboring waters. Uh, they are willing to participate either uh, by paying or working. Uh, there were lots of, lots of uh, people who wanted to participate by doing something actually, not just paying. But uh, what we need to give them is, is the opportunity to do so. So I would think that the next step uh, for us, like uh, for the uh, city authorities and, and environmental authorities in Finland, is that uh, uh, what are the steps that we make that possible? And uh, if you've been doing anything like that, and if you have any sort of uh, practical solutions of, of, of participating people, I would love to discuss about that with you. Um, so. That was uh, all. Thank you very much for, for your patience. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Uh, as Brian Cody said, uh, I'm actually an economist by my vocation, and it's always hard for me when I'm somewhere between environmentalist or ecologist. But in this case, it was actually, I think, a plus because it was the first case study in, in Bosnia on such a, of, of ecosystem service valuations. And since I worked uh, in, in financial markets before, it was very normal for me to, to express something in, in value of money, as, as you already said. But it was hard for, for us, actually, to express ourselves in, in front of biolog biologists and people who, who actually care about nature. Yeah, it is, uh, it is always hard to, to express that nature should have some value or some menu value, but we, we, we had a lot of, uh, uh, it was challenging, let's say it. It was, as, as we said already, the first case study, actually we had two. Now, I, I will present shortly two case studies, but first one was in, 
in uh, Hutovo Blato, and these studies were actually conducted within a WWF project, Living Neretva. Actually, that project was, I think, four years uh, happened in, in, in Bosnia, and then in, 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 the, in that project, within that project, actually, the, there was a plan to, to, to have some uh, ecosystem service valuation studies. Microphone, sorry. <laughs> is it okay now? Hmm? I don't know. Is it better? Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, it was the first uh, case study, so yes, we, we had uh, actually the evaluations were results of these facts. It was very actual topic. It is still, and it was in that time, it was in 2000, I forgot to say, we did it in 2010. And uh, it is, of course, decision-making tool for different ecosystems. And these values supposed to be included in all EU national economies. Unfortunately, Bosnia is not in EU yet. And also, those uh, values are not included in national economies still, but it was in 2010. So uh, these uh, uh, valuations we have done for, for two different ecosystems. We had two different teams for, for these studies. Uh, the first one, the pilot study, was Hutovo Blato Wetland, and the other one is Bilecha Lake, artificial lake, also in Neretva uh, River Basin. Uh, we used definition, uh, actually we agreed to use this definition, which was adopted in Millennium Assessment 2005, that ecosystem services, I think that you already mentioned the same one, are the benefits that people have actually from ecosystem itself. As I already said, it, it is even uh, difficult to express uh, in, um, more in our language, but also in English, these services, to express it as, as, a, as a something like, like uh, in our translation, it is hard to express it, you know, it is, I don't know, we don't have a proper word for these ecosystem services. So, so it's really hard to express it. We use it like usluge. I don't know whether somebody knows our language, but even in English, I think that it is not so easy to, to, to explain what does it mean when you say that you will explain it to, to for, for example, to some stakeholder like farmers or whatever. So it's really uh, hard to explain what, what does it mean. I will just shortly show you, uh, some, say something about these two case studies. Uh, this is Hutovo Blato. It is a, a special and, and unique wetland, Mediterranean wetland, and it is uh, located in Delta of Neretva River. You, you see the, the, the size. It is nature park from 1995. In 2001, it was also registered on the list of wetlands of international importance, Ramsar's Convention. They used to have a lot of birds. Unfortunately, I think that now they, 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 the number is decreased. I don't know whether it's a huge decrease, but, but I know that it is decreased now because of the, some, some, some happen, happenings and, and actually some bad management, I think, also. Uh, the, the challenge of, of evaluating the, uh, the wetland and to estimate the total economic value of ecosystem services in, in, in such ecosystem is actually to, to, to draw public and political attention to the need for conservation of all of those uh, services and to set priorities for the benefit of both also humans and the nature. So to put this in some balance to, 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 to conserve this biodiversity values and all ecosystem services that, that we can find in this wetland but also to, 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 for, for the well-being of all humans and people who are actually living there for local people. So the, the, uh, in this wetland, there are about, uh, uh, not on, of course, on the, on the spot, but around a wetland, there are about 2,500 2, people living there. And the key threats for Hutova Blato was actually disturbed water regime biodiversity loss and the lack of financial resources for efficient fu functioning of the park. Uh, they, they do have somebody who is in charge for managing the park and actually it is 18 people employed in that company 
and they are not able even to, to, to maintain themselves. The other study was Bileća Lake. It is artificial reservoir. Uh, it's also in Neretva uh, river basin. It's uh, in river Trebišnica. It is the largest artificial reservoir in the Balkans. Uh, it is actually made in early 60s for the purposes of uh, hydropower production. There is a lot of fish, different fi fish spa spa species, and there are around 12,000 people who live in this village. It is a small city near the, the, the lake. The main threat for this case study was that actually uh, uh, some ongoing project of constructing the new dams and also new hydropower plants. It actually, I forgot to mention that this, this was all, all, um, constructed because of the hydropower. So the goals for, for, uh, for those studies were for Neretva, uh, for, for Hutovo Blato, to assign economic value to selected service. Somebody already mentioned total economic value. We, we, since it was the first case, we had very ambitious goal to, to put total economic value for all <laughs> services provided by this, by this uh, ecosystem. And it was, of course, not possible, and we had very small resources, uh, even some small number of people worked on that, and even money, of course, was a problem for, 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 for conducting uh, such huge uh, exhibition, I would say. But we, we, we did something, of course. Uh, it was also a goal to, to evaluate the contribution of selected services to local populations <coughs> and to those who are actually direct beneficiaries of course, as well as wider community, since this Hutova Blato is uh, like well known in in whole country, and people from from all over the country, and even uh, I forgot to mention that this is also very close to Croatia uh, uh, border. Yeah. Then uh, it was a goal to express the value of ecosystem services as a key factor for sustainability of Hutova Blato as as such and to create a tool for decision makers to develop socially and environmentally acceptable and economically reasonable management strategy. Uh, goals for Bileća Lake was to provide economic information on specific ecosystem services to estimate the contribution of these services to life of local stakeholders and the wider population, and to assist planners and other politicians to develop this uh, feasible strategy for the management of the, that village a lake accumulation and in the sense of these future plans that they, they, they had for this uh, hydropower. So uh, I have only five minutes <laughs> still. Then uh, I will go. So we, we, we actually uh, conduct all, all phase, phases of, of these for these studies. We had stakeholder analysis. We had uh, a selection of... of of ecosystem services. So uh, reasons for this selection for Hutova Blato, the selected were biodiversity, since there is a danger of its reducing. The fishing, we thought that it was important because of the recreational and commercial fishing, tourism and recreational services, this cultural, uh, like you already said. The river flows and flood, it was this control role of, of this wetland, which was very important for this uh, part. And you didn't mention educational services, but those are also part of culture, yes, cultural services, and very important for this, uh, this, this area. For, for other uh, study, there were electricity production, so like, like provisioning function with electricity production, uh, production drinking water, and, and uh, fisheries, and then a regulatory function, flood protection and flow control, and this uh, irrigation, of course, role. Then cultural services were uh, tourism and recreational services, and this uh, education and research is because a lot of people come there and, and do their researches th uh, on that area. And of course, this supporting role for uh, biodiversity. We used different calculation methods, uh, but I will just go uh, mention this uh, 
contingent valuation method, since you already mentioned this willingness to pay, we had a, a uh, in, on Hutova Blato, we, we, we conducted a very, very deep survey. We, we created questionnaires with a lot of different questions, but among all of those questions, we, we had uh, the question willingness to pay, and we actually use it for, for uh, determining the, the, the value of biodiversity on, on that wetland. Like whether you are willing to pay or not uh, for, for, for conservation and for... for uh, for Hutova Blato, and to be honest, uh, uh, even more than 50% said that they will, they are willing to pay, but all of those 50%, maybe just few of them were locals. You see, our, our survey sample is that we, we divided like n local population, non-local population, people, then somebody who did visit this wetland and somebody who didn't, then somebody who is from Bosnia or some f foreigners, etc., etc., and actually uh, most of the people who said that they are willing to pay for this are not from, from that area. So, so it, it is also, like you said, very questionable whether it's something that you can lie on, lay, lie on but you can use it as, as a, some, some uh, guidelines. We have two minutes, sorry. And we also came up to the conclusion that they are willing to pay around 10 euro per year. So it would be maybe, I don't know whether it's enough, but because of the number of visitors, it, may, it, it could be enough. Some conclusions, uh, so uh, on, based on estimated monetary values for Hutovo Blato, we came up to conclusions that it is necessary to work on conservation of biodiversity, that tourism should be more developed, including these recreational and educational services, because there are a lot of students come to, to, to Huto Ablato to learn uh, and to research, and then appropriate financing model should be created to include wider community and projects which will result in adequate water levels should be designed. Those were conclusions from this case study. For other, it was uh, that use, that water can be used for to produce electricity, of course, on some sustainable development way. Then uh, fishing and hunting also should be, uh, they are development potentials of Bilecha the Lake, then biological diversity and tourism and recreation. Common to both studies were that actually poor social and economic state of Bosnia society we, we always have a problem with, with, with data and data collection. Uh, either there are no data or they are not uh, reliable at all. Uh, then uh, we actually have, have common for, to, to both studies also the problems and recommendations that we uh, found in separate cases. So this economic valuation can be useful through building stakeholder dialogue and of course to, 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 uh, to include different stakeholders, different uh, sectors and everything, and to set priority, priorities for programs, policies, and actions that protect or restore ecosystems and their services. I, I, because I was <laughs> warned, I, start, I, I really, I now thank you, and I, that's all. If you have questions, Thank you, Alison. I think that, first of all, we want to... Okay, thank you for uh, the opportunity to show a little bit uh, of the, the work. I must say that um, if you read the abstract of the presentation, it's a little bit out of ecosystem service. Uh, anyway, um, I'm going to present uh, two case studies. Um, of um, uh, restoration projects and a perspective on uh, ecosystem service valuation that we can maybe use. So it's a little bit uh, teasing uh, for the, the audience. Uh, so uh, in the introduction, we have already heard about the, the, the benefits rivers uh, provide. And uh, I'm here uh, using the... Um, 
the nomenclature by reform where uh, sand gravel is a provisioning services because there are other nomenclatures that do not consider uh, sand gravel or um, uh, extraction, uh, inert extraction as a provisioning service. And uh, I'm also using here the notion of the individual loss of welfare owing to resource depletion or uh, quality decline, and in including here restoration um, 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 efforts uh, and costs as maybe uh, an environmental uh, cost. Uh, so these are <laughs> major negative uh, impacts. And uh, repudiable and recover are uh, cooperation projects under, under the Interreg initiative uh, that engage uh, partners uh, across Europe to work and act together for the benefit of sustainable management of uh, rivers, clearly increasing uh, will, um, human well-being. Uh, so I'll present you uh, briefly some case studies on uh, repudiravel, then recover, and then some opportunities. So this is. 10 partners from those regions in Europe with the goal of developing sustainable uh, management models uh, of riparian areas. Uh, the funding, total funding uh, was that, and uh, these are some of the outputs, but I'll focus on river restoration projects. Actually, the first one is, uh, to be more precise, uh, mitigation. Uh, project that is because of uh, um, a huge um, uh, extractive uh, industry there, we, you had a uh, major um, uh, landscape uh, degradation. It was then used after the extraction as a dump and a debris deposit. So this was the general aspect of it. So, uh, and uh, linking with the first presentation, well, clearly here, the driver for, uh, for paying the actual restoration was the scenic recover. As biologists, we took the opportunity to restore it for the feeding, nesting, and resting area for birds, and uh, importantly, triggering the natural vegetation recovery process because there were no uh, available um, uh, propagals, uh, natural prop uh, propagation in, in the area. So this is the general plan. We had we made some uh, reprofiling. So I'm now uh, showing you direct cost, that, that is just the tender, when you have the plan and then you contract someone to, to do it. So th these are the direct costs, and these included debris cleanup and uh, soil reprofiling, and, but in these costs, uh, you, 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 we didn't include native plant propagation because we had to, and it, this, this was uh, um, a high cost in, in the project. And then, we also made some uh, removal of exotic species, planting some trees, and we are going back a clear little history on human use and human perspective of <laughs> a wetland. So this is, and, and, and it actually is based on uh, um, um, archaeological data in, in the fields, okay? So this is, and then <laughs> we started to <laughs> do a lot of changes, 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 and then this. And well, let's have a look <laughs> to the problem. So the decision to restore was essentially due to cultural services. So landscape was mainly the driver uh, because so a landscape service um, that uh, interestingly also linking with one of the talks uh, because there was this desire to build some uh, uh, future uh, views, villas, <laughs> views through the, to the wetland. So they were really engaged. So um, the population of Alpiarsa didn't really like the after extraction landscape, but was not willing to pay for it. Because if you, and this links with the presentation, both other presentations, is that um, this is a rural um, village. So for you to have uh, an idea, the, the, the number there, it's uh, 7,700 uh, uh, inhabitants. And, and if you divide the, the value, just the tender value, because you have the, the, all the other costs, you'll end up with a value of 
approximately 6 euro by habitants. And the mean wage is, is that in the village. So it's, uh, if I would ask someone in, in the village if they were willing to pay 6 euros uh, in, in one month, or just that contribution, that it's uh, an expressive amount of, of money. So, um, and this decision uh, alone, based on the CENIC, um, had impacts on uh, developing the project, because as soon as we uh, uh, made the cre uh, um, debris cleanup, the, the politicals were less engaged in uh, the success, the actual success uh, of uh, other benefits uh, being uh, delivered. So um, this ecosystem service uh, are, uh, are anthropocentric, uh, highly anthropocentric uh, oriented and the perspective that, that you use them uh, is, uh, is relevant. But these are uh, linked, uh, as you will be seeing, with ethical uh, uh, values, some things degrees on, uh, of importance. And uh, where in Portugal we often uh, see that northern countries have uh, more uh, environmental, uh, a higher level of environmental uh, ethic uh, values than uh, southern countries. And well, uh, this is um, this is uh, a pitfall because in 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 the project um, what uh, um, what happened is that um, if you if you use them and and I think the ecosystem services approach was uh, developed primarily has a, um, a tool to influence politics to go in the conservation uh, uh, di direction. But there's a, a problem that uh, politi uh, politicians will use it in, uh, with other ethic values. They, they will uh, look for uh, uh, something uh, uh, a, a method and uh, then go and have a look for the the energy uh, <laughs> uh, sector uh, valuation and they will just aha here the, is the reply for for all our um, um, uh, uh, problems uh, meaning that um, uh, for instance when uh, they have to come up with a compensation measures, if you don't value nature, see, if it doesn't have a huge figure, the, the number of compensation measures that you, they will uh, be engaged, uh, it's, uh, uh, can, can be used uh, uh, wrongly, in, in, in my opinion. So here we have in Alpiarsa then, when the, 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 the project was being made, there was this uh, industry, um, well, peat extraction industry, because the, the, um, the wetland had uh, peat, and the, the amount of uh, revenue value there uh, in, in terms of peat is um, uh, 32 uh, million uh, euros. Uh, so um, this, uh, this came along when there was this project uh, being developed. And the project, for you to have an idea, didn't have huge acceptance for the village because they, they were saying that it was too expensive. So we agree that it's bad and we need to restore it, but it's too expensive. But well, there was always work being done in the field. And then this pop up. And uh, it was interesting that the decision uh, eventually was um, uh, um, was uh, made uh, by, <laughs> OK, so, um, uh, so the, the decision was made by, um, by the population influ influence because they were arguing that uh, someone used and benefited from the extraction of gravel and now we are all paying for the restoration. And now someone wants to uh, have the benefit of extraction 
the peat and we are going to pay again for the, the benefits that uh, we lost, that, that means the, the, uh, the landscape. So this came into the new technologies, <laughs> blogs and Facebooks and everything. So eventually, uh, the pit was not extracted due to, to the raise awareness and the ethic values. So, so this, is, uh, this is how politics also work. And uh, it's true that legislation did not allow it what was actually used as an excuse because the indemnity that was uh, uh, to uh, the state had to pay in case of any uh, of any loss uh, is uh, was uh, roughly close to 1 million so uh, can cultural services be valued uh, 32 million euros so th this is a question because the decision was made. <laughs> Can we use this to value? And um, and even uh, also, uh, this raises a, 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 a question on intergenerational <laughs> equity uh, because there was these gen generations that are using ecosystem services and others are paying for for it, so I'm not going. Uh, well, I've already mentioned fairness and social justice. So this is really important of the environmental education programs that go along with river restoration projects. Someone in one of these European conferences was uh, a little bit against and call, calling it a Disneyfication of <laughs> of rivers, but. Uh, the, these are still quite very useful as conservation uh, tools. So here uh, you have another uh, another um, restoration project. Just to let you know, uh, I'll uh, pop up with in the end uh, with with the major results. But then you have uh, here another project, and uh, well, these are some of the outputs. Here uh, an example. Uh, also of uh, of the costs. This is in a Natura 2000 area where you have lengths, and uh, th these uh, this project was mainly made for um, uh, uh, compensation me measures of of the dam, and then you have this uh, uh, restoration done in uh, um, Spain, and this done in uh, Extremadura. And these are, it's just for you to have a look, these are the, the, the summary uh, values. And you have there the price per meter or price per hectare of the intervention and the, the price per uh, habitant. It depends on the benefit uh, that was directly raised for the action uh, itself. And you can see that uh, in rural areas, the, 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 um, the first two cases are... Uh, um, the, the price per habitant is uh, much higher. And there's where maybe the, the environmental uh, scale of values is, is, is lower, though they have, uh, they have the burden of, of uh, uh, preserving the, the, the landscape. So benefits foregone can be quantified in terms of uh, money to restore them to as close as possible. So they provide sufficient benefits to human well-being. So restoration uh, projects can, uh, and restoration uh, itself, uh, the prices can be used, uh, uh, or from my point of view, can be used as uh, valuation methods. And that's why River Wiki <laughs> might be so useful to, well, maybe try to reach uh, uh, um, some figures on the prices of the restoration intervention. So, I'm um, just to conclude. Uh, opportunities. Uh, well, is, this is opportunities um, uh, for uh, um, ecosystem services and again conservation uh, perspective, because restoration cost analysis uh, should be included in the ecosystem services valuation. From my point of view. Um, because you, when you have the total value, when you reach a total value, these are the surface, uh, services that the, the, the area or the, 
whatever you are valuing in, uh, delivers. But if you degrade them <laughs> to have that benefits, you'll uh, need to put money to achieve those standards. And in the meantime, you will lose all those benefits. So it check, it, 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 uh, from a decisional uh, political point of view, this is highly relevant. Uh, okay. Um, okay, okay, I'm just, um, well, I, I'm just going to leave it there and <laughs> for you to read and maybe you can discuss this after, uh, after the break. So. Thank you, Anna.